This What's Working with Cam Marston podcast is brought to you by Stella Artois Beer. What's Working with Cam Marston is brought to you by Stella Artois Beer. Stella Artois is a perfect beer for celebration. Nothing caps off a big sale, hitting your incentive goals, or a profitable quarter like a round of Stella's. Brewed first in 1708 as a special Christmas brew, today Stella is a gift for everyone to enjoy year-round. Stella Artois. Find it wherever fine beer is sold. everyone to another episode of What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is the show designed to bring you information on the workplace, the workforce, and the marketplace trends shaping the workplace, the workforce, and the marketplace around us. My hope is that you'll hear something on this show in a conversation with one of my guests that will give you some ideas, some inspiration, and some motivation that will help you get a little bit better at whatever it is that you do. We try to find the people that think differently or perhaps do things normally and their regular course of business that is unusual for us that maybe we can learn from. One of the things I've seen recently, and I think it was in Fast Company a little while ago, uh, so I'm talking about the last year, was this attitude or this idea of spontaneous teaming. And the premise is essentially this. You pull together a group of people who have never worked together before. You pluck them from other teams, pull them together with the assignment of one task. They're given one specific narrow task to complete or to solve for the benefit of the organization. And once it's completed or solved, the team then breaks back up. And the goal is to pull together people for the team who have very unique capabilities and skills, pull them together again for the solution of this task. It's not a a long-term team. It's a a very short-term lived thing. And the article was on how to go about doing this and the, the ins and outs of spontaneous teams and the benefits and how to do it, et cetera. Well, this idea has kind of been rattling around in my head of spontaneous teams. I love the concept. I love the kind of the mission uh, that's given to them. It's almost as if it's a military mission of go go take the bridge or something like that. And once the bridge is taken, the team dis- dissolves or goes back to their, their old teams. And I thought, where is this happening? Well, actors do it on a regular basis, I thought. Actors come together and for the purpose of solving a problem, which is, let's say, performing a play. And they've never worked together before. They've been chosen for the unique skills and talents that they bring to the stage in this conversation, the unique talents and skills they bring to the stage. And they're pulled together and they go through this process of becoming a team. Sometimes these teams can be long lasting. You've read stories about some of these actors and some of these age old Broadway musicals and shows that have played that role for years and years. Some of them, though, come together to perform this play one time. And I wanted to speak to an actor, and it turns out I know one. He's a Tony Award-winning actor, I'm happy to say. His name is Frank Wood. If you look him up in IMDb, you'll find him on there. He is the only, to my knowledge, the only person that I know that makes his living full-time as an actor. He is not a waiter looking for acting jobs. He's an actor. And uh, he's quite good at what he does. You'll see that and you'll hear it as I talk to him about his roles and how they go about it. So this episode of What's Working, we're going to talk about spontaneous teaming through the point of view of an actor. And what does it take to pull a group together and everybody do their job very well? And you're going to hear some really interesting stuff as well as uh, from Frank, because he's an interesting guy and, and a really got a savvy, some very good savvy on the work that he does. It shocks me, not shocks, but I'm always impressed by how much people will pay to be entertained. And it's conversations like that as we see some of the salaries of some of these actors and some of their net worth. I used to look at it and Bruce Springsteen's net worth and even Jimmy Buffett's net net worth is more than Bruce Springsteen's according to Fortune and stuff. It makes me think about my buddies at Sandifer Financial, Jamie Sandifer and Mark Salyers and what they do 
to help people manage the, the affluence that they may have achieved. To my knowledge, they do not represent either Jimmy Buffett or Bruce Springsteen. Let me be clear. But they do help people who have earned a, a handsome income or have a habit of saving more than they spend and are looking towards their future. Jamie and Mark will sit down with you and help you plan out what your next chapters are going to look like. As well as you're going to bring financial services products to your workforce if you're a business owner. Let them talk to you about how they can help you do that and offer a lovely benefit to your employees. Sandifer Financial. Find them online, send them a message, set up a meeting. We'll be back after this break with actor Frank Wood talking about spontaneous teaming. I'm Eric Cromwell. The law firm of Cromwell & Associates can help guide your decisions regarding the life you've created with estate planning tools like wills and trusts. We've planned meetings with first-generation business owners and large multi-generational family groups. With locations in Mobile and Fairhope, we can assist you and your family through every stage of life. To learn more, call 251-605-9075 or find Cromwell & Associates on Facebook. At Spring Hill Toyota, it's just that easy. From our three-day exchange to free car washes, the benefits of the Spring Hill Advantage make the choice easy to see. We make it easy to own. Every vehicle comes with Toyota Care, plus our no-cost maintenance plan with free tire rotations and oil changes for four years. Get peace of mind with free roadside assistance 24-7. And don't forget, it's easy to buy your car 100% online. Visit SpringHillToyota.com today. It's just that easy. What's Working with Cam Marston is brought to you by Stella Artois Beer. Now offering the purchase of the Stella Artois Chalice, a beautiful stemmed glass with the Stella logo. The purchase of each Stella Artois Chalice provides five years of clean water for someone in one of 13 developing countries around the world. Learn more at StellaArtois.com. Stella Artois. Find it wherever fine beer is sold. A cool thing happened back in 64 That's when Keith Air Conditioning opened their doors In my family, turn to the experts is more than a tagline. It's a promise. Every Keith technician is an experienced AC professional, and that saves you money. Speaking of money, how about 0% financing for up to 60 months on installations of new carrier systems? Keith and Carrier, turn to the experts. Mobile's leading name in comfort since 1964 License number 83731 back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston, and on the line with me is Tony Award-winning actor Frank Wood. I'm going to read for you a little bit of the roles that he's been in. You've seen him before. I know you have. And then we'll get into the conversation. Frank won a Tony for the show Sideman. He went on to play the role of Gene in London's West End and down in Australia. On Broadway, he's been in the shows The Great Society. He's been in Network, which I think was Fantastic. I heard the reviews. I never got to see it. The Iceman Cometh, uh, one that I recognize, August, Osage County, uh, Born Yesterday, and Hollywood Arms. I'm going to give you some of the films he's been in. He's been in Joker. He's been in Dan in Real Life, one that I've seen, Changeling. He's been in The Royal Tenenbaums, and on television, even, The Prodigal Son. You recognize some of these shows. Blacklist, Mozart in the Jungle, Newsroom, The Good Wife, Modern Family. I remember that one, Frank. And my favorite, the one that's most dear to me, Flight of the Concords, one of the strangest and most funny shows that I've ever seen before. Frank, I'm honored to have you on the on line with me. Welcome to What's Working. Oh, thank you, Cam. The honor is mine. I really appreciate it. You come from a world that is both strange and rare to so many of my listeners of being not only an actor, but a actor who does it full time. You don't have a waiting gig. You're not, you know, you're not waiting tables on the side and waiting for your break. This is your full time gig. Tell us a little bit about your career and what's it gotten, what's it taken to get you to where you are today? And then we'll get into some of the workplace components that I'm very curious about. Sure. Well, it, in my case, it definitely takes a supportive family. I, you know, I grew up in a family that had some means, you know, uh, I, they paid for all my school and, and took out loans on my, you know, and, and paid the loans. So I, I got out of it. I went through 
high school, college, and then a graduate program for acting in you know, NYU's graduate acting program. And I was essentially debt free, but I was also sort of skill free as far as making a living goes. And I was, I, so I, you know, found some odd jobs, but I also, uh, you know, I, I did as you know much work with as many people I've met along the way and mostly you know, fellow acting students to do to go to places like Ireland for on a non you know, before I'd gotten my equity card, I went to Ireland and this weird tour, five American plays, and we performed in church basements and, and snooker halls, you know. Uh, and so I was keeping my, I was working all the time as an actor, but making virtually no money. And then I finally landed at a place called People's Light and Theater Company in Malvern, Pennsylvania, which was the, the artistic home of one of my teachers at NYU. Uh, she had a, you know, she taught at NYU, but also re- helped run this theater. And when I landed there at the age of 29, because I was now, I, you know, it took me, I was 27 when I got out of school. Uh, when I was 29, I landed there, worked there for two years, and then came back to New York and sort of started again. But that, but that at least established me as a working actor, an actor who, you know, performed and made money doing it and had, had some chops. And now I was back in New York again, meeting up with a lot of fellow students and finding ways to make theater and finding odd jobs. And the best odd, the best job I ever had that wasn't directly acting was working as a teaching artist for the, uh, for, um, oh gosh, uh, you call it a, <laughs> a, call it a teaching artist. Is that the term you a use? Teaching artist. Yeah. And it was a New York theater. It was at the, um, uh, boy, Lincoln center, um, uh, arts Institute, and it was a teaching artist is somebody who takes a teaching role, but teaches about their particular art form. So, I there would be a production that would go into schools. I wouldn't be in the production, but I would then follow up and go to those schools and run workshops with students about what that what they took away from that that theater piece they saw, and I would construct games or questions and try to get them to engage in the subject matter of the plays to heighten their experience of it. So I, I, I want to mention, this is kind of off topic, but you, you mentioned coming from a background of very supportive. You also have a sister who's a U.S. senator. Tell us quickly about her, and then we'll get into some of the, the workplace stuff. Yeah, well, Maggie, my, Maggie Hassan, who um, you know spent many years being a lawyer and, and mother uh, to two beautiful children and wife to a fantastic guy. Yeah, he, his job took him to New Hampshire, where he worked at Exeter. Exeter Academy, and she, they lived there for 25 years. And along the way, she was tapped by the then, I think, uh, I think governor at the time, Jean Shaheen, to run, uh, to to lead a kind of in, sort of inquisition into how New Hampshire was doing with children with special needs, how, how their education, educational needs were being met. Because Maggie's um, oldest uh, child is Ben, and Ben has uh, uh, was born with cerebral palsy. And she and had, you know, and had extreme uh, physical uh, and developmental limitations, but he was mainstreamed through school throughout his, his life in New Hamp- his childhood in New Hampshire. And, uh, and Maggie was able to speak to that. And that began her interest in political career. That and the fact that my father had had, a, he had worked in the Johnson administration. These, you know, so there was some DNA there, you know, some interest in the public, public uh, service. And so she ran for state senator, uh, lost, and then won, and won, and won, and then lost when the Tea Party came in. Uh, and then she ran for governor, and she won, and she won again. And then she was tapped, you know, when, in anticipation of Hillary Clinton becoming president, the, the um, powers that be in the United States Senate asked her to run for the seat in New Hampshire, the junior senator seat. And she beat Kelly Ayotte, who was then sort of the Tea Party choice, who had won, sort of one term. And she is in coming to the end now and running and up for re-election uh, as the junior senator from New Hampshire. Unbelievable. And her, yeah, and she's a Democrat, and she has done a lot of work uh, in helping. She helped New Hampshire establish the um, you know Equal Rights Marriage Act, uh, and she's done a lot of work in in the opi- opioid crisis, trying to unearth this one you know accountability. From the drug company. So in your family is not only a Tony award winning actor, but a U.S. senator who is uh, it sounds like never saw herself in that role and was kind of anointed and has found great success in that. And I've even heard that her name whispered around a presidential run at some point, but that's certainly down the road. 
uh, we could go on and on about what this DNA pool you come out of was like to create so much success. But what I want to get into is the work that you do, Frank. My audience are business owners, managers, leaders, people who have decision making authority in the world in which they exist. Most of my audience lives in and around Mobile, Alabama, here in the deep south where I live. However, there are listeners to the podcast from across the country. So we don't want to isolate our comments uniquely to this part of the country. And I want to hear about Mm -hmm. the work that you do in such a way that will stimulate the thinking of my listeners and make them a little bit better at what it is that they do. So one of the Uh things that has always astounded me about the work uh, that you're in and that anybody in your industry, your profession is in, is the way that they, you know, I, I, I don't know any other way to say it learn the lines. And there are people that, uh, you know, they do a different episode every week from what I see on the television. And it's an extraordinary amount of dialogue. How do you do that? Let's start there. And uh, we're going to talk about teaming, but let's start there with this question that's a forefront of my mind. How do you learn these things? So much of them. Well, there are actors who really like take the script and sit down with themselves and maybe an assistant or maybe another actor or a friend and learn the lines by rote even before the first day of rehearsal. But that is not my experience. My experience is that you, you know, become familiar with the play and then you go to your first day of rehearsal, talking about a theater piece now, where you have presumably four weeks of rehearsal and you start, you know, you you start reading the lines out loud. And as you're learning the context for which, you know, as you're looking at other people, hearing and responding to what they say and figuring out where it makes sense for you to move your body and space in the set the way Usually by the first day of rehearsal, somebody's taped out the areas that you'll, you know, what the set dimensions are, where the furniture is and all that. And you, the, the, the understanding of the context helps you build a familiarity and a kind of muscle, muscle memory with the lines. So part of it is you say the lines a lot and then you use them in context a lot. And then at some point you really go off and you start putting them into your head. You know, you do, you do start, you do have to find an assistant, a production assistant or a friend or your wife to sit down with and just help, you know, say the lines back and forth. They read the other parts and really and really nail them down. But I would say if, there was, if it boiled down to anything about learning lines, it is repetition and gestation, which is say them a lot, then leave them alone and see where they settle. And of course, for that, you need time. Uh, and in film and TV, there is less of that because you there's less time. But of course, there is less. Uh, you're not working towards a day when you will know the whole television show by heart. You're only learning the scenes you're filming that day by heart. So that um, that has a, you know that divides up your your process differently. Uh, but the principle is the same that you need you need to repeat and you need to relax. You know, you need to and you need to understand why you're saying what you're saying and to whom you're saying it and for what, yeah, as I said, why you're saying it, to what purpose and how much it matters to you. You know, those are sort of all acting principles that are true in both film and stage work that you are trying to understand uh, why you're saying it. And that makes it easier to remember. It gets in your body that way. How, and, and I can stop there for a moment if you want, or I could continue. <laughs> well, let's do this. We're coming up on a break and I want to, I want to come okay. back from break and, uh, the question that's coming to my mind right now is, do you ever say, you know what, I'd rather say it this way. And uh, if that's taboo or not, or are you getting in the face of the writers or the playwright or something like that? But let's pick that up after the break, because we got to take the break. And <laughs> I don't want to stray too far from the question that originated our conversation with is tell me about spontaneous teaming, which is what it's called in the business world and how you guys do that. I'm on the line with Frank Wood. He's Tony Award winning actor for the role Sideman. He's been in so many different shows, Grey's Anatomy, Sopranos, Law & Order, SVU. We're going to come back after this break to learn more about his work and spontaneous teaming. We'll be right back. I'm Paul Lewis, General Manager for Lewis Construction. Many of our commercial buildings you drive by daily on both sides of the bay are the fruits of our client relationship since our beginning in the early 80s. It is our mission to bring value to our clients, from retrofits to ground-up construction and everything in between. We have more advocates than any of our competitors who have been in business twice as long. Same with repeat business, same with referrals. Find us online at RoyLewisConstruction.com and let's talk about your next commercial project. 
Hi, I'm David Nelson, brewmaster and owner of Braided River Brewing in downtown Mobile. We make drinkable, flavorful craft beer perfect for life on the Gulf Coast. So pick up one of our six packs before your next adventure or stop by our tap room for a relaxing afternoon with friends. Follow us on social media for the latest beer releases and events and ask for a Braided River at your favorite bars and restaurants. Thanks for your support. We look forward to sharing our beers with you. This is Cam Marston, and I'm with Cajun Mike of E3 Termite and Pest Control. Cajun Mike, if a homeowner thinks they have termites, do you offer inspections? What about a, someone buying a new home? Can you come in and take a look and see if there are termites in there, a new home? Yeah, basically what we will do on a home uh, above and beyond anyone else is we actually do a thorough inspection. But above that, we will use infrared imaging that will allow us to see problems in the wall and at times can tell us if there's anything going on. That's fantastic, KJ Mike. How can people find you? They can find me at e3pest.com. That's the letter E, the number three, pest.com. King Solomon wrote, without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. The law firm of Cromwell & Associates has the legal counsel that can help your business succeed with experience in LLCs, corporations, and tax. I'm Eric Cromwell. Our law firm has locations in Mobile and Fairhope. Call 251-605-9075 or search for Cromwell & Associates on Facebook. And let's discuss how we can help you. Frank Wood is on the line with me. He's been in the film The Royal Tenenbaums. He's been in the film People I Know, Pollock, 13 Days, The Changeling, Taking of Pelham 123. Let's not forget that he has won a Tony in the show, the Broadway show, Sideman. Frank, prior to the break, and I just want to get this uh, addressed, do you ever go prior to the break? Let me back up. Prior to the break, we talked about memorizing lines, and I'm curious if you ever are able to say, you know what, I'd rather say this line this way, or is that taboo? And by this way, do you mean different words, yeah. or do you mean a different, yeah, uh, you in television and in film, because so much is being uh, built, you know, those sh those the on camera work is often like building an airplane in mid flight. And in some cases, I just worked on a show uh, a couple of days ago where the director was also the writer and he did not care if I said the lines the way he had written as long as he was as he was watching it, the scene was working out the way he felt it should. And so frequently you can you can absolutely say could I just cut this? And in theater, you can, if you're working with the playwright, for sure, you can say, do I need to say this? And they might say, yeah. I mean, they'll probably say yes, but they might say, oh, you know, no. If they're really working with you, they're listening to their own play and they're listening. They're probably there to find out if what they've written works the way they want it to work. And they will concede that you don't have to say that line that way. But if you're working with a, uh, you know, a dead playwright or you know, somebody's not there, the, uh, the operating principle is that you are there to say their words yeah. the way they wrote them. You, and uh, yeah, and in t TV, if you're working, they if you're working on a, like a you know a show like uh, Blacklist or something, there's a script, script supervisor, and unless the director intercedes, the script supervisor will come over and say you missed this word, you missed that word, and and you go back and you get it right. And by the end of the day, if they've run out of time and you haven't said it right, they will move on. But the writer, the writer. Uh, really matters a lot in television and uh and they they sort of live in different separate silos the writer and the director and the production team and the actor are all doing their own jobs and the writer is sort of you have the writer isn't you know the writer needs you to say the words they wrote uh and then they might they might step in and say oh yeah that's fine you know that version is okay because again that's it's all happening that day fairly quickly you arrived not knowing what the set would look like the director arrived, not really knowing if they had all the, the elements they had asked for. The writer isn't sure if the plot is working out the way they expected to, <laughs> you know. So, so there's a lot of wiggle room, but but it has to be negotiated. Absolutely, it sounds like the old expression: you don't want to see how the sausage is made; you just want to eat the you sausage. Kind of don't, right? So, when I'm sitting on the couch and I'm watching you in one of these episodes of, let's say, Law and Order SVU. 
what I'm seeing yeah. there is it looks beautiful on camera. It sounds like it was perfectly created. However, in the process, it may have been kind of mixed up and everybody's given and taking along the way. Yeah, I mean, what's definitely true is that people do, for the most part, know what their job is. And there isn't a lot of there isn't very much confusion about uh, about boundaries. And so once those boundaries have been established, then it's you can find your moments to sort of step across the line and say, I'm having trouble with this. Yeah. So, but television, especially a, a show like SVU, has a, um, you know, it's, it's got a formula for sure. And it is the director who's doing the most, like, you know, dancing as fast as he can. <laughs> you know, the director's looking at all the elements and going, e, you know, I better get this going and this going and this going. And he's in conversation most explicitly with, the, with his crew and the director of photography. That relationship, director of photography and director, is the mo that's, that conversation is going on all the time because they're trying to the shot the real storytelling is in the shot selection. Interesting. So the you know so the actors are try, are really crossing their fingers saying I don't want to script the lines but they do the actors will script the lines all the time because in those shows you arrive the the principals have not had much time to learn their lines mm -hmm. so they've been handed the, they've looked at the script maybe that morning they read it once in a read through the whole cast a week earlier but. But that was, you know, that was a week earlier and they've been doing this episode now. And so they show up kind of with the script in their hand. They're little for that scene, the sides, what they call this. We call them the sides are in their hand and they are kind of committing to memory just then and there. And they get more leeway. They're, yeah, sure. The principals, the principals will miss a you know, drop word, change it, decide this doesn't need to be said. And people will sort of say, OK, uh, you know, I see what you're saying. Sure, you bet, you bet. Uh, and if you're a guest on the show, which is usually what I am. You don't feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need to know it. You, you, you've yeah. had time to prepare. You need to know it. Yes. Right. Let's right. get into the subject. At, uh, I was about to say the subject at hand. The subject at hand has been uh, learning lines, but let's get into this spontaneous teaming thing. So the way it's described in the business world is pulling a group of people together who have never worked e with each other before. And they're given the task of accomplishing something, one very narrow thing in a short amount of time. And these people are coming together, like I said, unfamiliar with one another. They may be aware of who the other person is, but they've got to form a cohesive bond very quickly to function as a team to accomplish this task, whatever that task may be. In my mind's eye, the perfect duplicate for this is the world in which you live and of actors coming together and directors and writers and script supervisors, perhaps, coming together to accomplish a specific task, which could be a play, which could be a scene, something like that. And my suspicion is this trend of spontaneous teaming in the workplace today is not a trend in the acting world. It's a reality. It's the way you live. Mm. Talk to me a little bit about what you think of when I say spontaneous teaming as it relates to your world. Well, I think about uh, when you just sort of begin, like, you, you know, for, for a play, you know, you arrive in a room uh, and at this point in my life, it's a pretty familiar idea, but it becomes familiar pretty quickly. Uh, probably a big table and you know, scripts, you know, in binders that uh, uh, spread around the table. And you find your way, the director does the sort of the host, you know, to, and eventually, uh, and often there is, uh, if it's you know, that first day, all the people responsible for the production, the office staff, the producers, the whoever, you know, people in charge of you know, tech crew will be there and they'll be kind of everyone will say their name and introduce themselves to each other kind of you're usually standing in a circle and then people leave and you get down to uh reading the play and for experienced actors this is a kind of a i wouldn't call it a sacred moment but there's a lovely moment where you know where you're just you're going to begin finding your own voice and other people's sometimes literally their eye contact but at least your awareness of them and their awareness of you. Uh, and you begin to speak and do sort of one thing at a time, which is say your lines with whatever truth you know about those lines at that moment, you know? Uh, and this is, an under, this is a process that most actors understand and share, that we are just beginning and we're not trying to prove anything to anyone, but we're making ourselves available to each other. And the director is, in, is a great host and usually, and and sometimes they take a, they they really step away and try not to interfere too much. But they are in charge of what ideas are going to be pursued in the play, and what are we going to agree on is the reality of this play, 
And they, and so I look to the director to be at least, and especially it's true particularly in television and film, to be a good referee so that their actors don't feel like they have to negotiate with each other about what they're going to do. The director is in charge of any negotiation and you get to do what makes sense to you. And when it runs up against another actor's interpretation, the director can step in and say, well, let's feel this out. Uh, let's find out where the truth lies, or I know what the truth is, and it's this one, you know. And and the tutor and the, the actors, you know, this famous, you know, actors can famously disagree and and and, ha- and be contentious, but that's not the rule. That's more the exception. So it sounds like the director is the team leader. He, you use the term refer- referee, team leader. But what I heard you say is that on this first gathering of the team, there's first every. The room is full of everybody that's somewhat involved with this project. And then the, the, those that are just the, the most important people remain. Mm-hmm. And you begin with, and you didn't use this term, I'm using it, with an extraordinary amount of vulnerability as you go and you feel your way through the script, which could be yes. in the business world, which could be what is the aim of this team? What is the goal of this, this action here? You guys mm-hmm. vulnerably feel your way through giving and taking as much as you can. Now, you said something about eye contact. Are you making eye contact with other people as you go through this? I mean, there's that's a way to develop intimacy. And I don't mean romantic int- intimacy, but intimacy with your peers. Tell me about that. Yeah, no, that's a, it's really an important part of acting and and, uh, I, and and obviously of living. You know, we I mean, I think everyone knows, you know, when you meet somebody, eye contact is good you know, or is preferred and that there are people who are. Uh, you know, introverts who really have a hard time with it. But the uh, the eye contact, either literally like finding eye contact or at least some awareness, you know, some reaction and acknowledgement of the other person's efforts, you know, and reacting, you know, you're ideally, you, if you're in a di- piece of dialogue, you know, you're sitting in a room, let's say with 12, a- 12 actors, let's say it's a big production, um, but you have one scene with, you know, one other actor. And this is a moment where you, you offer up the lines and you, and this is where the thing that makes this uh, not so scary is that you've got text. You have got a reason to be there and you've got, if nothing else, you've got the words to say, and that's your bottom line. Yeah. So, so with those, you, if that's all you do, you're still okay. <laughs> you know? And on top of that, you are, you are offering some, some interpretation of this line and you're not, it's not an external, you know, you're not, um, it's not something you thought of at home and you're going to say, I'm going to try this out when I get in there. It's you. It's what makes sense to you in that moment. And you offer it up and you send it to where it needs to be sent, that other person, presumably. And you hope that they can do the same with you. And you know that other people are watching and listening and, of course, to some degree, judging. And you, you but since everyone's got to be in that same position at some point in the, in the reading of this play, you know, people are judging with with some some leniency, you know, and uh, and there are stage managers there who are taking notes about you know they're working away. Usually, from the minute you start, they're sort of trying to figure out production values and stuff. But they're there to assist the director also, and and, and maybe there's a dramaturg who's there to say, oh, this you know, in Germany in 1855, this word really meant you know the opposite of what you're saying, you know, wow. but, uh, you know, uh, so that's so. So you're figuring out some technical details, but you are, as you pointed out, you are making yourself as vulnerable as you can afford to be. Interesting. Let's take a break and come back with that, pick it up and talk about how that vulnerability, how that sharing turns into solid teamwork in time and in practice. Frank Wood is a Tony Award winning actor. I'm talking to him in New York City. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. We'll be right back. At Roy Lewis Construction, we're in the business of adding value. Whether it's working with you to meet your unique business needs or making investments in our community in lasting ways, providing unparalleled value and quality in every commercial construction project. When planning your next commercial project, reach out to Roy Lewis Construction. We'll pair you with a designer that best suits your project needs and work with that designer to balance the best architectural outcome with the best budget outcome. Find us online at RoyLewisConstruction.com, building legacies one relationship at a time. 
At Spring Hill Toyota, it's just that easy. From our three-day exchange to free car washes, the benefits of the Spring Hill Advantage make the choice easy to see. We make it easy to own. Every vehicle comes with Toyota Care, plus our no-cost maintenance plan with free tire rotations and oil changes for four years. Get peace of mind with free roadside assistance 24-7. And don't forget, it's easy to buy your car 100% online. Visit SpringHillToyota.com today. It's just that easy. Think about how people really see you. The kid at the drive-thru just sees a coffee drinker. Please pull forward. Your local barista sees the person who loves a smiley face in their latte. See you next time. It's kind of the same way with insurance. Other insurance companies just see a customer. But a State Farm agent sees more. They see you as a neighbor. Your State Farm agent is here to get to know who you really are so they can help life go right. Call me, State Farm agent Allison Horner, and Mobile at 666-1616. I'm David Nelson, brewmaster and owner of Braided River Brewing. We want beer that goes along no matter where the adventure takes us and that doesn't make us choose between great beer and drinkability. We're drawn to the Delta and united by beer because to us, the best way to celebrate the Delta is to slow down and savor the moments and the beer together. Come visit our tap room in downtown Mobile and ask for us at your favorite bar or restaurant. Visit online at braidedriverbrewing.com. I'm on with Frank Wood. He's been in television shows that you recognize, one being Newsroom, another one Mozart in the Jungle, Modern Family, which was fantastic, The Good Wife, Blue Bloods. Uh, Let's see, I'm reading from the list. Grey's Anatomy, which my family, the ladies in my house, consume repeatedly. I mean, over and over and over again. Uh, Regional Theater, he's been at the Goodman Theater, Long Wharf Theater, Hartford Stage, Williamstown Theater Festival. This guy makes a living as an actor. He does not wait tables and hope for his break. He's in it and he's on top of his game. Frank, prior to the break, we were talking about going into this read and and the goal being how do we create spontaneous teaming in the workplace and are using your experience in the acting world as the model. You were saying you vulnerably go into the reading, you're giving as much as you can, open to criticism. How does this gain traction to creating a team to conquering a goal? Okay, right. Well, it begins to, first of all, lay out the the play. You know, I mean, you're, again, you know, we have, I'm not sure in the business world what their direct equivalent would be, you know, whether you're, you know, you've got to build a business model or build, or actually you're building a, you know, a building, I don't know, you know, but the, in this case, we're, uh, we know we have a play to do and we've all read the, the play. We, we know we all have a sort of idea of what the story is. And so we're, we're beginning to offer ourselves up as, you know, pillars in that story, you know, uh, things for other people to lean on. Uh, and we are, and, the, you know, there's, um, an acting term, you know, if you, if you, we often talk about committing to a choice. So let's say, you you know, Hamlet is, the actor playing Hamlet, uh, is committing to the idea that his mother, uh, it, who tried to kill, was, was complicit in killing his father. The actor, you know, one actor might think that's not what Hamlet does, but you commit to a choice, which gives the direct, you decide, you know, I think, I know, Hamlet knows in the top of his play that his mother wanted his father dead. So you commit to that choice in your reading of the play, and now the other actors have something to, to react to. And the director has something to look at and react to. And he can say, no! <laughs> you know? yeah, right. but, but you've begun to build something, something that can either be edited out or built on. And every actor is, has a moment where they're asserting something. Where their where their line or their behavior it's not always language it's often you know where you walk or who you look at or the chair you sit in is a choice that another actor has to deal with and ideally these are all choices born from the text I mean in my in my world there are other you know you can go to the theater the arts world will you know will reinterpret all choices and all disciplines at some point but for me. We all look at the text and say, what makes sense given the words we have to say and what and the stage directions we've read? And what what is the most what is the richest choice I can make? You know, where where will I uh, 
uh, render the most um, dramatic choice. Uh, and so the, the actors are all kind of exchanging, trying, you know, and there's definitely deference. You know, the lead has the most responsibility for making choices. And the supporting roles and the people after that are most often reactive instead of assertive. But at certain points, everyone asserts something. And you want your assertions to be justified by the text and also um, committed to. The actor wants to commit to those choices so everyone else can really experience those choices. And therefore, their imaginative life is, you know, is itself active. And that's another word, active. Your theater is supposed to be, you know, the actors are working not at just static, at representing something, but at living something. And so you are each trying to find, offer something to somebody else that they can use to make their life richer. So you commit to a choice. I love that. You commit to a choice, uh, but you have to accept that this commitment you've made based on your interpretation of the script can be edited by the lead actor or the director to say, no, mm -hmm. I see what you're doing, but we need it differently. So you commit to a choice, but you can't. Can you argue for it? Can you be too wed yeah. to it? You absolutely do argue for it, but you and you argue at you argue for it from the from the text, you know. And people, you know, you point to the lines or at least to what's happened in a previous scene. Or all the things that are said. If you, you know, if you if you really got it um, ready to, you know, you really uh, know what you're, <laughs> what you're talking about. You you start talking about why you think it is this way. And a director, you know, a director might sort of anticipate that this is going to take too much time or that this is going to take you down a road that they know is going to work. So they'll say, I hear you, but no, yeah. fine. You know, fine. This is what I think it is or find something else or just let this go for now. And let's just work. Let's just move forward. Say the lines. Some, you know, there are some times when you don't know what to commit to. So you commit to getting the words out of your mouth. That's yeah. it. You know, uh, and then and let other people, let other people's commitments and choices uh, take take center stage, um, and then you. But I, all of this is contingent on you, again, being able to listen. Yeah. So you, sometimes you assert something, and then when this director said, "All right, yeah, no, just let's move forward," you start listening because you don't know where you are, and you start listening to what other people are saying, and you start asking. You go home that night, and you say, "Hey, where am I? You know, why did I think that?" And they it's so wrong. So what? What are the, if it's the director's way, not my way, what are these circumstances? You know, oh, my mother, my mother, in fact, loves me, but is terrified of the man she's married now, my, you know, my uncle, uh, you know, and, and so I must see from a point of view of I'm so bitter that my mother is so weak. Yeah. It's not her, she's not uh, a traitor, she's just weak. Okay, okay, I see, I see. Let's see if those lines make sense that way, you yeah. know, and it's where you put your point of view. Um, tell, yeah. tell me about a, a group that you were with, Frank, uh, uh, a, ca a cast. Let's try to get my terminology correct. A, ta uh, a cast yeah, yeah. Uh, where you guys really hit it perfectly and that you're so proud and uh, it worked so well. Yeah. Well, definitely Sideman. I mean, uh, Sideman, we had plenty of struggles with it, but we were a group of actors who were in all within a 10 year range of each other's ages, you know, and for most of us, it was not necessarily the beginning of our careers, but this was like our first Broadway show uh, or, and, uh, and we were helped, the playwright had not finished writing the play and the director was a very opinionated, Michael Mayer, very opinionated, strong director who helped uh, the playwright sort of finish writing the second act. And we all helped too, because rehearsals were partly in that case, Helping him, he would watch us and say, "Oh, the scene that scene's not working. I got to rewrite it." And over time, it, we just were so in love with our own journey, <laughs> the journey of the success of this play and the music. I mean, the play is about jazz, and we got to, you know, we got to embody the people who could play this music, and that was richly, that was just deeply satisfying. And we were all new enough to this kind of success that we didn't, um, uh, we didn't know what was happening and therefore we were our happiness you know our excitement to be there was wasn't shaded by by cynicism jadedness or doubt you know yeah what about is it the same process on television my guess is that it's not well no i mean the and the i mean television again uh 
you know, like for a long running or you know show that's got a few seasons under its belt, there are these series regulars, and for them the experience could be glorious. You know, they could be finding. I mean, if you get to be successful, if something gets stamped with success, it's hard not to feel uh, that your life has taken on a sort of glow. You know, right. uh, so in that sense, you know, but the experience, I I just did two days on a television show called The Accidental Wolf, and it's not on. A network. It's going to be it's on a platform called Topic, which just bought it. It was a web series, and now it's going to become a like a stream TV series. But I five years ago we did a I did a scene from it, and then I got picked up. You know, five years later, same character to be further along in the story. Um, and a lot of it is done under the anxiety that you're not going to. You know, you, a lot of it was physical. In this case, you know, there was a lot of physical action and knives being drawn and pills being forced on somebody's throat and, and it's all, it was all outdoors on location and then it is mostly a technical uh, effort in which you try to get something right and you work towards getting it right repeatedly and there's always there are many things that can go wrong remembering the sequence of physical events because you haven't rehearsed them the day before you've only rehearsed them five minutes before, you know, right. and there was a fight choreographer who was really trying to help us do this safely. And so you're worried about getting it wrong and being unsafe. So you want to make sure you're safe, but it's safe going to be dramatic enough. You know, right. if you do it right, you know, if you do it the way the fight choreographer asked you to, yes, it will be, but you're just learning what he taught you. So, so for most, so the experience of being successful at that leaves you with pride, but the day it is not like your third or fourth performance after a night in a play where if it's successful, you you live a life on stage that is mostly an expression of your craft, you know, um, uh, an uh, embodiment of the thing that gives you joy. Yeah. In, yeah. in film and television, it is often, it has got to be found in small moments. And it's found finally when the editor editing a process is done and they say, oh, it's great. And you come and you watch it. Oh, it is great. It did work, you know. Right. Uh, but the and, and it's certainly uh, I think experienced on camera actors can get onto a set and know they're in the pocket of something that works for them. You know, that they're going to that over this long day of, of cut and repeat, and cut and repeat. And now we've got to do the push, you know, now we've got to do the same scene again, but with the camera close up and it's not on you, it's on the other actor for now. And then it's going to be on you, but you just did your best work when the camera wasn't on you. you right. know? So you have all that going on, but there are times when absolutely that is deeply satisfying, but it is a much more catch as catch can. And in the case of theater, you're living in a much more, in what I think of as a more wholesome environment in which you build over time towards a goal realize the goal and then and then relive it over several nights or you know and sometimes for more than a year and then that becomes its own struggle yeah. how do you sustain something but but theater has a you know is a you are making something integrated and it's harder as an actor in film and tv to feel like you're you're building something integrated uh, it sounds so what i've heard you say is the team has a leader the the, the cast has a leader uh, you're very vulnerable to one another. You're open to coaching. You are allowed to argue for your point of view. But mm -hmm. uh, when the team leader says, yes, you've made your point clear, we need to move on, you quickly move on. you got to keep moving on. And yeah. you're, you're being vulnerable. You're willing to shift. You're willing to adjust in order to benefit the script, the cast, the ultimate goal, et cetera. And then on the th in the theater, when it's working, you know it's working, you feel it working, you live this, you act, you live this person in, in, in the play. And when it's over and the curtain comes down, you feel like it's been, you know, what is the description? What does it feel like yeah. when the curtain comes down and you know it's well, been well? Yeah, yeah. It, well, it's definitely a feeling of completion and, and gratification. I mean, you can, you can, you know, the curtain comes up and you take your bow and, uh, I, you know, most of the time I really enjoy taking my bow. Yeah. You know, I enjoy seeing an audience out there applauding and, uh, and there are exceptions, you know, and there are times when it goes really well and you don't feel it for sure. So that's another lesson actors are always learning that your cathartic experience is not always the best, uh, storytelling experience. Yeah. You know? Um, so, so actors of course are always coming away from things with various opinions about how it went 
often unrelated to whether the audience had a good time. Yeah. You know? uh, uh, so it's not, a, I don't mean it's a, it's not pure in that sense, but, but you can also say, ah, you know, you can, you can evaluate your experience and it's very hard to, to evaluate your uh, success of your experience in film and TV, except through the director saying, yes, that's what I wanted. Good. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, Frank Wood is a Tony Award-winning actor for his role in Sideman. He's been in the movies Joker, Detroit, Gold, St. Vincent, Changeling, People I Know, Royal Tenenbaums, 13 Days, Dan in Real Life. My favorite TV role of his, Flight of the Concords. Loved you in that role, Frank, particularly when you danced in that. I'll never, (laughs) ever, ever forget that. Uh, And Frank, you've given us some wonderful insights on what in the business world is called spontaneous teaming and what in your world is called just a day at the office. Thank you so Uh, much. Cam, it has been my pleasure. Thank you. Folks, we'll be back after this break with final comments. You're listening to What's Working. Hi, I'm Cam Marston, host of What's Working. My carrier Infinity system is quiet, energy efficient, and runs like a dream. To keep it running smoothly, I rely on a maintenance plan from Keith Air Conditioning. With a Keith maintenance plan, your home or business receives discounts and 24-7 priority service. Give Keith Air Conditioning a call today at 251-476-3610 or visit keithair.com. Keith and Carrier, turn to the experts. What's Working with Cam Marston is brought to you by Stella Artois Beer. Stella Artois is a perfect beer for celebration. Nothing caps off a big sale, hitting your incentive goals, or a profitable quarter like a round of Stella's. Brewed first in 1708 as a special Christmas brew, today's Stella is a gift for everyone to enjoy year-round. Stella Artois. Find it wherever fine beer is sold. This is Cam Marston with Cajun Mike of E3 Termite and Pest Control. Cajun Mike, houses on pilings can have termites eat their way up inside the piling and enter the house. The homeowner never knows about it, but your company offers protection. Tell me about that. Yeah, Cam. Uh, Basically, uh, what we have designed is a program, and what we do is we will actually drill to the center of the piling and put a product in the center that will stop the termites from coming up into the home. Stucco exteriors as well? Correct. How can people find you, Cajun Mike? They can find me at e3pest.com. That's the letter E, the number three, pest.com. When you make the right decision, it feels good, like picking the perfect accent rug or choosing a good night's sleep over an all-night crime show binge. It feels really good to make the right insurance decision, too. I'm State Farm Agent Allison Horner, and that's why I'm right here in Mobile to help you select the right protection at the right price. I'll make sure you understand your State Farm coverages so you'll know what to expect if the unexpected happens. With me as your State Farm agent, it's easy to make the right choice. You can come by, call, or click allisonhorner.com. When you want the real deal, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Hey, this is Cam. Thanks for listening. And I hope you're really enjoying the podcast. Do me a favor and search for Cam Marston on your social media outlets and like us or follow us or whatever is the right thing to do. Also, if you know others who'd benefit from the podcast, please forward it on to them and encourage them to listen. If you're so inclined, we'd love your rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Those ratings matter. Finally, don't be a stranger. Email me with your comments, your feedback, your thoughts, your show ideas, whatever. Cam, C-A-M, at cammarston.com. I'd love to hear from you. Again, thank you very much for listening. Now, back to the show. What I took away from Frank's comments was where he argues for the voice that he's taking as he reads this script and makes a a cogent argument for it. And when the director or the team leader, to use the business terminology, says, I hear you. However, we're going to take a different direction. He says, and people in his industry say, okay, I wanted to uh, argue for it. You've made the point clear. I will let it go and move on. And it's a vulnerability that I'm sure is a big part of making those successful teams. Frank, thank you so much for your time. 
That'll wrap us up for this week, everybody. You can find the show at whatsworkingcam.com. That's our online address where you'll see this show as well as many others. That's where you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or many of the other different podcast services that we utilize. Find me, Cam Marston, online. And uh, you can follow me on all the different social medias and email me with show ideas. We've gotten some good ones that are coming up. Cam, C-A-M, at cammarston.com. Show is produced by John Thompson with Ion Digital. Have a good week, everybody.